And when NCSC and I and my colleagues have looked at the creationist movement, and we've been studying this for several decades now, there are three basic arguments that arise from the creationists about evolution. And we call these the pillars of creationism. The first pillar is the idea that evolution is a theory in crisis. That evolution is weak science. Scientists are giving up on evolution. This comes as a surprise to the science faculty here. <laughs> the second pillar of creationism is that evolution and religion are incompatible. Basically, the idea that you've got to choose. You can either be a good Christian or you can accept evolution. You can't be both. It's a dichotomous choice. Third, the fairness argument that, well, if you teach evolution, it's only fair to teach something else and uh, balance evolution with the teaching of some kind of creationism. The first pillar, the idea that evolution is weak science, is the weakest of the pillars of creationism, although widely believed uh, in uh, many parts of the United States. <coughs> there are many, many resources showing that the creationist um, uh, claims about uh, the invalidity of evolution are just simply wrong. And we don't have time to talk about them tonight, but I encourage you to look at the sites talkorigins.org and pandasthumb.org if you want to know the specific arguments. Similarly, if you look at NCSE's book, Voices for Evolution, which is on the web, uh, you can download uh, the contents for free or pay us a small amount of money for hard copy. Um, you will find statements from dozens of scientific organizations illustrating to the public that evolution is really one of these core ideas of science. We're not arguing about the weather. We're arguing about the details. The second pillar that you have to choose between evolution and creationism, you have to choose between science and religion, is the most common pillar. And it again relies upon this dichotomous choice. I'd like to suggest that rather than a dichotomy, we should really think about the relationship as a continuum from creation to evolution, not a dichotomy, but as a, as a range of ideas within Christian faith. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the flat earthers. And everybody says, oh, come on. There really aren't modern day flat earthers. Get real, Dr. Scott. Um, don't you love that illustration? That's just so wonderful. Um, but actually, there are 20th century flat earthers. And Charles K. Johnson was a proponent of a flat earth. Uh, this is his obituary. He died in 2001. And he believed firmly that the Earth was flat. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about Mr. Johnson's ideas, the UN flag shows a flat Earth. Uh, basically, to the flat Earthers, the pole is the center of the Earth, and the continents are arranged around it. I'm sure when they chose the UN flag, they were not promoting flat Earthism. But it's a good illustration, so I, that's why I show it. Um, and so obviously Columbus could have sailed around the Earth. He just sailed out to the edge and then went around, so it's fine. Um, the second most extreme of the creationists are the geocentrists, those who believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. Now obviously geocentrism was supported by the church back in the 1600s. Cardinal Bellarmine <coughs> said that the sun is in the heavens and moves swiftly around the earth and the earth is far from the heavens and stands immobile in the center of the universe. And this is because of the literal interpretation of the Bible. There are modern day geocentrists such as Gerardus Buol who follows the Tychonian view. The yellow dot in the middle is the sun, but if you look very carefully at this, the blue dot is the earth and if you look very carefully, all of the planets are going around the, the blue dot, and, excuse me, all of the planets are going around the sun, but the sun goes around the earth. Okay, so there's various ways of slicing the geocentrist pie, but it is still around. Now, why does Gerardus Buol, uh, who has a, an engineering degree, why does he believe that uh, geocentrism is the appropriate uh, relationship between the planets and the sun? Because he is a biblical literalist in the strictest sense. He has written, if God cannot be taken literally when he writes of the rising of the sun, how can we insist that he be taken literally when writing of the rising of the sun? Most people who consider themselves conservative Christians are neither flat earthers nor geocentrists. But I'm showing you this um, series just to sort of give you the full range. Flat earthers and geocentrists believe in 
an ancient Hebraic view of the Bible, which of course, excuse me, a view of, view of the earth and the cosmos, which is expressed in the Bible because the Bible was written uh, thousands and thousands of years ago in a pre-modern time. In this view, you'll notice that the stars and the sun are underneath the firmament. The firmament is a metal dome that surrounds the earth, and there's waters above the firmament there. That's where the waters, the 40 days and 40 nights of waters from Noah's flood came from. And there's also waters below the firmament. But the earth is conceived of as being round. Uh, the Bible talks about the circle of the earth. A circle is not a sphere. A circle is two-dimensional. The ancient Hebrews looked at the earth as being shaped like a nickel. It was round, but it was flat. And it was geocentric because the stars and the moon were under the firmament. So from this very, very, very biblically literalist point of view, the flat earthers and geocentrists believe that they have to redefine uh, cosmology in order to fit their interpretation of the Bible. Moving along in the continuum, whoops, sorry, um, forgot I had animated the sign. The young earth creationists are the next in the continuum. Now, these are, th this is a pretty active movement. Young Earth creationists are the followers of Henry Morris, who began this movement in the 1960s. Obviously, there were predecessors, of course. But Henry Morris invented something called scientific creationism, which was an effort to take a literal interpretation of the Bible and claim there was scientific evidence to support it. Uh, this was back in the 60s and 70s when the argument was being made that you should teach evolution but balance it with an alternative science of creation science. Special creationism is a point of view that is embraced by the young earth creationists, followers of Henry Morris, creation science people. This is the idea that God created everything in its present form as we see them today, pretty much all at one time. Uh, so mammoths and people and dinosaurs, all of these creatures were created at the same time. This is an illustration from one of the creationist websites. And so humans and dinosaurs coexisted, and humans and all uh, other creatures coexisted, and most of these other animals that are extinct today died in the flood. Um, in the Moore's version of special creation, this occurred over six 24-hour days. There are other versions of special creationism in which God creates consecutively over time, something called progressive creationism, which is basically what the intelligent design people are promoting, where God creates things in their present form, but sequentially through time. So first he creates single-celled organisms, and then simple metazoa, and then more complicated metazoa, and then he creates uh, the vertebrates, and then lions, and tigers, and bears, and so forth. Um, Some claims of the young earth creationists are just wrong from the get-go, as the idea that petroglyphs of Australian Aborigines indicate dinosaurs coexisted with humans. These, again, are illustrations from creationist websites. Sometimes I am criticized for poking fun at the creationists. Well, no, these, this is what, you know, I'm describing what they believe. This is on their websites. You can find it yourself. So here is a petroglyph. This is a, you know, when you, uh, etch out in stone a, a figure, a petroglyph. This is a petroglyph from Australia, and this proves that it was actually an early dinosaur. But this is a classic case, case of shooting an arrow and then drawing a target around it. Um, <laughs> perhaps this needs no further explication. One of the favorite places that creationists find evidence for Noah's flood is Grand Canyon, and of course, the flood of Noah is very important to the young earth creationists because they believe that all sedimentary deposits from the Himalayas to the Colorado Plateau were all laid down by Noah's flood. So um, this uh, wonderful 300 mile long feature with up to 5,000 feet of sediment was laid down during approximately one year and cut during a period of days. And you find in the creationist literature that they can divide the uh, Colorado Plateau into pre-flood, early flood, late flood, and then uh, post-flood periods. <coughs> Needless to say, geologists find this absurd uh, for many, many reasons. And those websites that I suggested, particularly talkorigin.org, can give you some very good refutations of what the young earth creationists call flood geology. 
And if you want more, um, Steve Austin's Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe is um, a very well-known young Earth creationist book that describes their views. Um, at the National Center for Science Education, we have a raft trip down Grand Canyon every summer where we discuss these as well as other views, and um, we have a really good time. That's not a smile, by the way. I'm saying, take the picture, because I'm about to slide off that rock into the Grand Canyon, into the, into the Colorado River, and it's about 60 degrees there. It's really cold, but we have a really good time at our Grand Canyon trip, so consider it somewhere.